Hello and welcome to today's session, Beyond the Ink, a guide to e-signature and e-vaulting implementation for the equipment lease and financing industry. In today's session, our expert panelists from Moritz, Hawk & Hammerhoff, E-Original, and Maxim Commercial Capital will be covering the following agenda. How the e-signature process works and how to implement a solution that is compliant and accepted. Why the equipment lease and financing industry is moving towards digital acceptance and the different e-signature and verification methods associated, benefits to digitizing the origination, funding, and lending process, overcoming internal organizational barriers to going digital, followed by a use case from Maxim and how they were able to capitalize on going digital. Finally, at the end of the session, we'll provide answers to any questions that you may have. We ask that you hold your questions until the end. Once we have reached that portion of the presentation, you can use the chat feature to message your questions to me and I'll facilitate them to our panel. I'd like to take a moment to introduce today's speakers. On the call, we have Bob Cohen, a partner at Moritz Hawk & Hamroff, John Jacobs, eOriginal's Director of Sales and Operations, and finally, Shervin Rashi, COO of Maxim Commercial Capital. With that, I'll pass the presentation off to Bob Cohen. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> this is uh, Bob Cohen. I'm a lawyer in the industry uh, for over 28 years, and I've been working with several of my clients as they transform their ink shop into an e-signature e shop, and uh, I'm hoping I can answer a lot of your questions. Um, I want to start off by telling people how I got involved in this. Um, when I first heard of electronic signatures, I thought we were essentially talking about getting documents signed by fax or later on scanned signatures to make sure that they were enforceable. I had no idea that the e-signature system and what you're going to learn about today really is so much more than that and so much better than that. And we're going to talk about how it has various protocols built into the program to make sure that the people who are signing the documents are actually the people who are signing the documents. Also, what's very interesting about the e-signature process is um, in the spring of 2013, uh, just over two years ago, I was putting together my first seminar with respect to e-signatures. And I was contacting my clients uh, and finding out which shops were using them and which were not. And I had a difficult time finding companies that were doing them, whether they were my clients or not. There were very few places using it. A lot of people knew about it but said nobody was really um, implementing them and it was quiet. And then I did my first session. Uh, found one or two companies that were willing to uh, speak on the subject. And a year after that, we're talking May 2014, six of my own clients had made the decision to change over. Now, this had nothing to do with my presentation, um, although I wish it did. Uh, it just had to do with people's sensitivity and acceptance of the e-signature sy uh, system. For example, now, it is very popular in the automobile industry. Uh, BMW, Mercedes, various other cars, you go in and you're signing everything electronically. Tesla, they have a very unique system. You actually sign your lease, okay, in the car on their computer. It's very interesting and very progressive. But the main reason why I think it is catching on at this point is that people are ready, the public at large is ready to accept it. If I told you 10 years ago you would be depositing checks with your phone, you'd be laughing at me. 10 years ago we were worried about buying things online on the internet because we were worried about our credit card numbers. Now everyone does that routinely. That's what the e-signature process is going to be in this industry, in my opinion. Because without being able to see all the people on the webinar here, I can tell you that um, I'm in my 50s, and I remember, okay, what it was like when my parents didn't, didn't know how to do certain things and how I was programming the VCRs and how, how I was doing all the quote-unquote high-tech things of its time. Now you have all the 20-year-olds, the millennials, that expect to do everything on their phone. And as they get higher and higher in the workforce, they're not going to put up with what we thought was normal which was, oh, we'll wait for FedEx at our office to sign our office lease. 
they're going to sit there and say, I'll do it tonight at dinner when I get home on my phone. I have my PDA. I have my tablet. Let's just do it that way. And those are the people that are the future of the industry, and those are the people we have to at least be thinking about. Plus, as you'll see throughout the presentation, you're going to see how there are certain direct advantages to doing business through e-signature. So for startings, um, working off the screens we have now, electronic signature, it really is broken down into two essential areas. How the document is signed, okay, similar to the way that you may sign off on a credit card, uh, receipt at a uh, at a department store, and, and it's a lot more than that, but that concept. And then how they are stored. Remember, the purpose of this is not simply to make the document easier to sign and get signed, but it has a lot to do with what do we do with the document after it is signed. To some degree, if you then print it out and put it in your file cabinet, you're back to the way we are currently doing business. Now, that can be done. But most people who are really embracing the e-signature system are now storing them electronically as well. And uh, e-original, uh, John Jacobs will talk to you about both the signing and the storage uh, uh, processes in, in full detail. Then the last couple of items are managed. How do you manage these documents? If you're going to do a syndication, if you're going to pledge them, if you're going to assign them, how do I get my electronic document from my vault, and you'll hear that phrase throughout the presentation, to somebody else's vault? How do we actually do that? We're going to talk about that as well. And then the last thing on your screen is the phrase released, creating an authoritative copy. What that means is how do I get my quote-unquote original or what's going to be our original, okay, if I need it? One thing that jumps to mind for a lot of people are court. Sometimes I need an original in court. If I have an electronic document, how do I create that? One, there is a way to create it, and two, you'll see there are laws in place that you may not need it. Next slide. So, um, Allison, next slide, please. Okay. So, that's the e-signature process from a 30,000-foot level, how you're going to sign the document, store the document, assign it, and if necessary, how you create the, the hard copy when necessary. What you're going to find throughout um, this process is that the e-signature process uh, saves time, expenses, and efficiencies. Now, yes, there's going to be a startup cost to getting all signed up and, and, and ready to go. But once that's done, my clients are telling me it is so much easier to get documents signed. Number one, um, they can't make a mistake because the computer prompts people where to sign. And if you don't sign it or initial in the proper locations, you can't go on to the next uh, page or the next document to sign. That, from a practical point of view, seems to be a huge upside for my clients that are doing this. Two, as a result of that, they're saving both the time of their employees and the expenses of getting documents re-executed uh, on a regular basis. The other thing is from a litigation point of view. It reduces the risk of forgery and fraud. And we're going to talk about the authentication process, and John's going to go into that. But the real high-level thought of what do you mean by authentication is that how do I know that the person clicking on yes is really Bob Cohen? How do I know that's Mr. Lessee, and how do I know it's not some other person, a broker, or this or that? Okay? And there are ways to protect against that, and John's going to go into that in a, in a, in a big way. And also, um, I will talk at the end of the session about how the electronic signature itself is better than a traditional ink signature when it comes to guarding against forgery and fraud. And then the last item that seems to be uh, a huge upside is the speed time to funding. One of my clients allotted two hours to fund their first transaction that they did by e-signature. They were done in 15 minutes and shocked. And they've been running, running with the races since then. They, they, they cannot speak too highly of it. It's fantastic. So that's what the, the general benefits of e-signature are. And now we have to get to, Allison, next slide. Um, is it enforceable? 
And the answer is, in a nutshell, yes. This is not, this seminar is not designed for lawyers. Um, certainly, people are free to contact me if they need more specifics, but on a very high level, there are two statutes out there that make electronic signatures enforceable. Uh, surprisingly, they've been around since the early 80s. And one is the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, or commonly known as UEDA. And then the other one is Electronic Signatures and Global and National Commerce Act, which is obviously eSign. And when we're talking about a signature, it's very important that we're not necessarily talking about um, a facsimile of your signature or even clicking yes. And it's defined in eSign as an electronic sound, symbol, or process attached to or logically associated with a record and executed or adopted by a person with the intent to sign the record. So what that definition means at a very uh, basic level is it can mean anything as long as whatever you are doing expresses your intent to adhere or agree to the terms of the document. People have used sounds. The click yes is a perfect example of it. Those are the types of things that can be done. Most people are doing some type of click yes or facsimile signature, and Shervin will talk about what his clients are doing on a, on a regular basis later on. Um, you should know it applies to Article 2 on sales as well as Article 2A on leases. Um, the whole electronic chattel concept is out there and covered under 9-203B3. And that just says if you're doing this with notes and security agreements and things of that nature, by all means, it is generally enforceable. And, um, and you have to do certain things. Now, when I say they're generally enforceable, I'm going to say, say it this way. The mere fact that you do not have an original signature in and of itself does not make the document invalid, which is basically lawyer ease uh, stating that you still have to make sure that you can show that the person expressed their intent to sign the document. You still have to make sure that the document is the document that was signed. And all the other issues that you may have associated with any other traditional ink signature, okay, could still come in and invalidate it. But the mere fact that they are signing it electronically in and of itself should not, okay, bar the document from being enforced. Now, a couple things to keep in mind with that. Those are federal regulations. There are also state law and regulations that you're going to have to pay attention to depending upon your market. Notarized signatures, I'm finding them inconsistent. Real estate documents, some states work with real estate electronically and some do not. Uh, but the trend seems to be that people are heading in that direction. So those, those are the, uh, the quick legal points you need to know about why they are enforceable. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to John Jacobs, who's going to start getting into the nitty-gritty on what you have to do to make this uh, e-signature e process work. John? Thank you, Bob. Uh, so what does the complete electronic signature and electronic pro uh, chattel process look like? Uh, just as in the paper world, you start with, doc preparation or, or origination. Uh, so today, if you're doing it in paper, you'll have a piece of paper and you're filling out the blanks um, with a pen, um, or you, you could be utilizing um, an industry system or, or solution, a, a lease or loan origination system, uh, such as a lease team, right? So at some point, you're taking customer or lessee specific data and you're entering it to, to a document, creating something that is executable. Um, in the electronic world, uh, we'll want to uh, have an electronic version of, of your lease agreement and, and your lease deal. If you, if you don't have one, you can certainly work with your, your attorney to, to get an electronic version of it. And at some point, you'll want to decide what's the best path for your organization uh, to take that customer-specific um, data and apply that to the electronic document. So that's where it all begins, the, the preparation and the origination process. Uh, now, in the e-signature process, this is all about presentment and execution. So, in general, through the e-signature process, and we'll go through some of the best practices here um, in just a, uh, a couple of minutes, but in general, it's about presenting that executable document to your customer or the lessee, whether they be in front of your face and you're, you're on a tablet like an iPad, 
um, or whether they're remotely and, and they have a need to, to sign that document from their office, their home, or while well, they're on vacation in Tahiti. Um, so it's about presentment and, and ex execution, uh, giving the, the ability, um, regardless of where your, your customer is, to electronically sign that document uh, through the web service. Again, we'll, we'll go through some more of the best practices here in just a moment. Post-execution, um, and really during the, the execution phase, if you're signing documents that would be considered transferable, uh, negotiable, a chattel for instance, um, what are the best practices, what are the processes that need to be in place to ensure that there is an electronic asset that other organizations uh, will have confidence in, that other organizations can take control of, such as what they would have taken possession of in, in the paper world. Uh, the very first step as a part of this process is ensuring that there is a unique and identifiable um, asset or chattel deal that exists. Uh, Bob mentioned earlier, uh, he used the, the term authoritative copy. Um, we use the term authoritative copy as well as the UCC and the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act um, as the term to represent the equivalent, the electronic equivalent to the paper original. Um, and just to give a brief example on, on what that means, in the paper world, if you sign a chattel deal with a wedding signature and you were to make a thousand copies, uh, at the end of the day, you can reasonably distinguish the difference between the two. Uh, the copies, they look like copies, and the original, it looks like an original, and you're in possession of it. Uh, in the electronic world, if you think PDF documents, Word documents, anything electronic, um, they all look the same. If I were to make a thousand copies of a PDF document, now I have a thousand seemingly original versions of my deal, uh, which is the original and who has it uh, is always the question. So first and foremost, as part of the uh, electronic vaulting and electronic asset management service is ensuring that there is one unique and identifiable electronic asset uh, that exists. And it's taking that asset um, and managing it in a certain way to ensure that you can continue with your post-closing activities. Uh, just starting off with general vaulting services. Um, ensuring that the right people, uh, you know, the folks that need access to the document have the appropriate permissions and access to it. Um, and ensuring those that who don't need access to the document don't have access to it. Um, as, long as, as well as the, the ongoing storage and integrity ma management of that document, the, the integrity checks, making sure that the information within the document has not been changed um, and so on. Um, on to transaction services, which is really the working of the deal post-closing. In often cases, you'll have documents that you need to add to the deal. Um, you might have amendments that take place. Uh, you might have a need to take paper documents um, and add them to your electronic deal, um, providing the functionality to really work with that deal electronically, add and remove documents to it um, as need be, um, and in often cases today, what we, what we see is a big interest in converting the media, taking those old paper documents that exist today and uh, converting them to legally admissible um, electronic uh, original versions. Um, and on to transferable records. This is the, the, the piece that ensures that you can take that authoritative copy and work with the, the third parties um, in, in such a way that, that you do today, um, whether it be as part of a syndication, um, ensuring that those who have a security interest um, in that original deal um, have the ability to perfect electronically, uh, just like they would have the ability to perfect against uh, their security interest in the paper world, um, and also ensuring that those who need to take Control, uh, control we'll, we'll use as the electronic equivalent to paper's possession. Uh, control of the asset, whether it be for an assignment or a purchase or an acquisition, uh, such that they were able to take possession of that paper object um, in, in the paper and, and wedding world. So really that final layer is ensuring that there is a secure method to move or transfer that unique authoritative copy between the parties that have an interest um, within the asset. Allison, next slide, please. So what does the electronic signature process look like? Um, often asked what an electronic signature is. Uh, Bob gave the, the legal definition. It's an electronic sound symbol or process. And essentially, that can be almost anything electronic that you adopt uh, to be your signature. 
So it can be text type, meaning that you have typed your name into a keypad or keyboard. It could be a finger signature. If you were on an iPad or a stylus device and you draw your finger with your signature, and it can even be voice, as, as Bob had mentioned. So there are a multitude of ways uh, that you can uh, capture uh, your customers and your lessees' uh, electronic signature. So what does the overall process look like? Um, there are best practices, as, as Bob had mentioned, you have legal admissibility. Uh, you know, there, there's enabling legislation that allows you to electronically sign documents and take them into the court of law. Enforceability is a whole other thing. It's about the evidence that you're capturing through the process. Um, so ensuring that not only are you creating something that's legally admissible, uh, but also something that's legally enforceable. Uh, so we start with authentication. Uh, this is something we'll dive into just a little deeper uh, in a few minutes. But the question has always existed uh, since the beginning of the internet is, uh, who's the person on the other line? Um, so ensuring that there's a reliable means of authenticating the, the lessee and the customer prior to having access to the document, creating reasonable assurance that they are who they say they are. Uh, consent, uh, this comes with the legislation. It's ensuring that the, the, the person that you're requesting to electronically sign the document understands and acknowledges that they are partaking in the electronic process. They know what they're doing. Um, and having that as an auditable event, um, knowing two years from uh, down, down the road, you have evidence that shows that even at that very second they consented, they understood that they were doing business with you electronically. Opt out. This is very interesting. We, we see it used seldom uh, these days, but it's still important to have in place. You have to give uh, the, the customer, the signer, the ability to remove their consent or withdraw their consent all the way up into the time that they've actually applied their electronic signature to the document. Um, so giving them the ability to leave. You can't re require them to sign the document electronically. Although it doesn't happen often, you still need to make that in action. You need to give them the ability to leave if, um, if they choose that, that's what they would want to do. Um, now, the signature with the tent, is, this also goes back to the definition that, that Bob had, uh, had mentioned, the, the legal definition of an electronic signature. Uh, when you're capturing the customer's electronic signature, whether it be the text type or the finger signature, ensuring that there's a, a, a method or a disclosure that's in place that acknowledges that they understand that they are adopting that signature and applying it to the document with the intent to do so. Very simple, um, and it's often done with little disclosure statements that, uh, that are around the, the, the area in which they, they apply their signature. This is offered through the systems, uh, through the e-signature systems that, that you would use. So it's not anything that you need on, on your document, but just a, a method of ensuring that you have an auditable, auditable event that shows they intended uh, to apply their signature. Uh, just like in the paper world, if you ask someone to sign a document electronically, you need to give them a copy for their records. Uh, now this, what I will mention here, is also very important as it relates to chattel deals and, and to transferable records because if you think electronically, you can pull document, uh, copies of the documents very quickly. And typically this happens within milliseconds. So if you don't have an e-asset management or an e-vaulting system in place, um, you want to ensure that there's not a, a, a version of the document pulled from the system, even to retain, you know, for the customer to retain for, for their records, that's not properly identified as just being a copy. Um, but you have to make sure they have the ability. And typically this is done programmatically. An email notification would be sent to the signer providing them a copy for their records, or they could go to a receipt page afterwards and download a copy um, for themselves. Uh, John, again, yes. John, this is Bob. Um, j just just to, to back up a second. So when people decide they want to sign the document, you're going to go through an authentication process. You're going to um, then make sure that they've consented, they have the ability to opt out, okay? The program will set it up that when they are signing, we're clear that they are assenting to the terms, correct? Absolutely. Okay, and then you mentioned that they need they need to get a, a copy of the document. Now, I'm assuming, but want to be clear, that um, they don't need to get a hard copy of the document. They they can get an emailed electronic version of it. Is that correct? Yes, in, in very often cases, it's, it's set up uh, programmatically where the very second that they apply their signature, they're already receiving an email with a version to, to retain for their records, but they can also download a version uh, from the system onto their laptop device or you know, whatever it is that they're accessing it from. 
And does that, is, does that version indicate that it is a copy, or does that indicate that it is a copy of the authoritative original? How is it identified? If the appropriate process is set set up, um, yes, if you're assigning a, a chattel deals or, or transferable records electronically, yes, the process should be in place to clearly identify whatever it is that the customer receives as just being a copy of the original document or at least a copy of their version uh, of the original document. Okay. Thank you, and, Sid, and and that's very very important to to, to point out because it's you know um, with that process as I'd mentioned within a few milliseconds you have another copy of that document that is being originated or that is being created um, so you're only working with a couple milliseconds to ensure that nothing escapes the system that's not properly identified as just being a copy or a version of the document or of the original chattel deal. Uh, beyond that tamper sealing, uh, right? So there are a couple of signatures that are happening through this process. Uh, you have the electronic signature, and that's what the, the customer or the signer has adopted to, to be their own, all right? So that's the visual representation of their signature that you see within the document. Um, another signature that is taking place is actually a digital signature. And this digital signature is often being used behind the scenes to actually lock down the document. Um, to ensure that information within that document cannot be changed um, after it was electronically signed, um, without uh, detection, of course. Um, also uh, used to encrypt the document and the information that exists within that document. That way it's only accessible to the, the individuals that have the, the appropriate credentials to be able to access and, and review that document. So tamper sealing is another very important piece of the process, if for anything, just to make sure that uh, information within that document is unalterable. Um, again, e-asset management, uh, you, you won't hear me stress it enough if you're signing transferable records, chattel, negotiable instruments, um, having that e-asset management uh, process in place is, is pivotal to, to ensure that you can continue to work with any of your funding services or, or third parties uh, from a finance perspective uh, post-closing. Of course, throughout the process, review is important. If you think anything electronic is very easy to do, you can click a button and end up somewhere that you never intended to, ensuring that the, the customer has the ability to take these actions themselves, consent when, when they're ready, electronically sign when they're ready, and review the document, um, uh, their specific document, throughout the entire process. So having that adequate ability to, to actually review the information and take those actions on their own is a very important thing. Next slide, please. So back to authentication. Uh, again, as I mentioned, this has been the question since the beginning of the Internet, who is the person uh, on the other side? So there are uh, various authentication methods that are used to create reasonable assurance that uh, John Doe is who he says he is. Um, so Frontline authentication is, is what I'll start with. And what is frontline? It's the very simple frontline processes uh, that the, the, the signer or the lessee has to go through to authenticate themselves. In often cases, frontline authentication consists of um, them having to access an invitation through their email account. Uh, so at some point, they've had to log into their email in order to access an invitation that you would send them uh, remotely. Um, the capturing of the IP address, right? So capturing of the network or the physical environment that they are at when they've accessed um, that, that invitation and when they've come to the electronic signing room is another important event that's captured as part of the frontline authentication. Um, and then thirdly, having a unique password for them to be able to access that document. So typically, frontline, with those three methods, an email that they've had to access through their, their, their business or personal email account, an IP address that has been captured um, uh, from where they've accessed the document from, and a unique passcode that you've provided them um, that they would need to enter even before they have access to the document. That's this, is, this, this is Bob again. John, um, as the lawyer on the panel, what I need to be able to guard against when I'm authenticating or explaining to a judge, chances are the judge is, is, is older than I am, and he's going to be more uncomfortable with this than most people. How 
we know this is somebody who signed the document and not just somebody st sitting at that person's computer. And, um, you know, I go out to lunch, my secretary comes in, and before you know it, I'm leasing a few, a few dozen cars. So how, how do we deal with that issue? Um, I know one of the things that we talk about with my clients is that you want some way other than the computer that they are signing on to the lease with to get them information. For example, something perhaps coming to my phone or something mailed to them. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so you know, in, 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 you know, there's also multiple uh, you know things that happen outside of the e-signature process. The fact that you're doing business with the customer, the calls that you've had, the communications that you've had back and forth, kind of really add together to support um, and, and creating evidence in their willingness to do business with you. Um, once you you go to the electronic process and that frontline authentication, you're capturing key metrics uh, as far as the IP address their email account, and the fact is that that unique password. In often cases, I, I, I suggest that you give that unique passcode verbally, um, maybe calling and speaking with, uh, with the customer or the lessee and providing the, the passcode verbally. Um, beyond that, kind of what you had mentioned, text message and so forth, um, you can really turn it into a multi-factor authentication process. And this is actually really cool, um, and in most cases used in the lease finance industry. Um, so what does multi-factor mean? It, it means that you've taken several steps to identify and the, the customer is kind of taking several uh, initiatives in, in identifying themselves before having access uh, to the document. So multi-factor could be SMS. It could be um, in partnership with that frontline authentication, sending an, a, a secure text message uh, to the customer's mobile device with the password. Um, so not only did they have to have access to their email, and not only were they were were they at the IP address that's being logged, they also had to have that mobile device, uh, and, and all that information is going to be audited um, and, and saved for evidentiary purposes. So you had three different things that they've had to have access to in order to be able to sign uh, electronically sign the document remotely. Um, in addition to that, uh, to create more of a stringent multi-factor authentication process, you have knowledge-based authentication. Uh, this is what I often see used in, in the lease finance industry specifically. Um, and what, what is knowledge-based authentication? It's really using a, a Q&A exam. They call them out-of-wallet questions because the, 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 the questions that the customer or the lessee would have to answer are pulled from multiple public databases. Uh, in, in all the cases, if I were to steal your wallet, I'm not going to be able to answer these questions. Um, and, and only at the point when they successfully answer that Q&A exam will they be allowed into the signing room um, to, to be able to review and electronically sign um, their deal. So, so John, a, John maybe, maybe we should hear from Shervin now on what, what they're using over at Maxim because they've had to deal with this issue uh, recently. Shervin? Absolutely. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Bob? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I just wasn't sure if I'm still muted. Uh, so we actually use a couple of the different methods of verification. One of them is the out of wallet, uh, which uh, John just spoke to, uh, which we, if we're sending it directly to the signer, um, or if we're sending it to the vendor, the dealer, or the broker, they will then be able to share that with the signatories, the signer, who will authenticate themselves. Uh, however, in some cases, if they're actually sitting at the dealership in the event of purchasing or financing a truck, um, we'll actually be fine with the SMS verification. We found that in a lot of instances, people were unable to, ver to authenticate themselves with the out-of-wallet question um, because <laughs> for whatever reason, they may not remember where they lived 10 years ago or uh, the complexity of it was maybe too much. But for our, our purposes, and we check this with our legal uh, counsel, and Bob, of course, is, is uh, one of our uh, legal authorities on this, um, and he was fine with us just getting the SMS verification, which is the code going to the telephone uh, while they're sitting with whoever they're purchasing the unit from or whoever's conducting, I guess, the, the signing or the closing. Um, so those are really the two that we've stuck with. We don't do the non 
verification with it's just email only, just to add a level of of um, clarity to to who is the actual signature there. From 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 a lawyer's point of view, we need to be able to convince the other side that we had the right person. And you need some other way of getting information to the lessee or the guarantor other than in the same manner in which he is signing the lease. Because if I was to go up to a judge and say, Judge, not only did we capture his IP address, not only do we know it was from that computer, not only did we speak to him beforehand, but we also sent a, a passcode to his phone. Okay. We also called him at his office. We also sent him something in the mail, whatever it happened to be. And he could not have accessed it without it. Now, yes, it's possible somebody may be sitting at my desk after hours or during lunch, but the chances of them having my phone, okay, is really, really, really remote. And, and therefore, I think you passed the smell test in showing that this was the actual person who signed it. So, that, that's what we recommend, something to cover two methods of getting information to this person so that one person with your wallet or sitting in front of your computer cannot in and of itself become you. John, do you want to go back to e-vaulting? Uh, yeah, exactly. And that multi-factor process is, uh, is, is certainly more attractive today, having different methods uh, to support in, in the authentication of the signer. Um, next slide. Thank you, Allison. Uh, so back to the chattel, right? E-vaulting, e e-asset management. Um, again, uh, I'll stress this. It's important to ensure that there is a unique authoritative copy that exists um, and ensure that that authoritative copy is managed in such a way that it can either be securely managed on behalf of a secured party or your potential funding sources, or it can be securely transferred, sold, um, and, and securitized uh, to, to other parties. Um, so it, this is not a static process. It's not throwing a, um, a watermark over one document and, and then being able to distinguish. It's really how that chattel deal, how that authoritative copy is managed through its entire life cycle. Um, it's not records management. Uh, we, you know, these systems often work quite well with imaging systems and so forth, ensuring that all your other business applications have working copies. Uh, but it's, it's just important to ensure that those other business applications have identifiable uh, working copies and that the vault is properly managing the integrity of that unique original um, chattel deal. Um, so, just very briefly, um, often we, you know, we, we hear, will our bankers accept, uh, will our funding sources accept, what do the ratings agencies think? Uh, e Original has been at this for, for quite some time, um, and, and today it's, it, you know, it, it's just about knowing what your bankers and funding sources are looking for and having an education session with them, uh, you know, discussing with the bankers or the thir those third parties um, and how the electronic processes changes their environment. Uh, I had mentioned earlier um, the, the process of perfecting electronically. Uh, in the paper world, a, a funding source might uh, perfect by uh, filing their UCC1 and taking possession uh, of the asset. In the electronic world, they're actually going to perfect by taking control of the authoritative copy or the, the electronic chattel. So it's really just a matter of having a discussion with them to ensure that what you're deploying is also going to meet their needs. Um, and from a, a transfer of ownership perspective, for those parties that are going to need to take possession, whether it be a third-party custodian or whether it be a, a potential buyer, um, of the asset, um, ensuring that they know what they need in place. Uh, Bob had, had mentioned the, the, the process of vault-to-vault -vault transfer, um, ensuring that you're working with those funding sources uh, to, to make sure that they have an electronic vault in place um, that is capable of securely taking transfers of those uh, electronic chattel deals and securely managing the integrity of those unique um, electronic chattel deals moving forward. Essentially, I've negotiated several of these deals with funding sources, and at this, at least at this level, because it's relatively new to them as well, they are just concerned with compliance with the statute. 
and they basically take out the statute. There are certain things that have to be clear and met, and it's control of the document, the custodian that John was talking about, making sure that nothing can happen to that document without us knowing about it. Now, think about it. You have an electronic document that you're saying is your original that is electronically stored. Well, if it's like a regular Word document, how do you know you don't change the word from may to shall or change the, the lease terms? What eOriginal and other vaulting companies do is they make sure that document cannot be changed without that change being documented somewhere. And then when we have to identify an authoritative copy, okay, we then identify that this was the document and based upon the eVaulting service, there have been no changes to this document. Um, we haven't seen a challenge yet. Um, the funding sources are becoming more and more comfortable with it, and um, it's, the, it's, it's the way of the future. So um, something to keep in mind. I know we're running a little tight on time now, and I want to make sure we get to Shervin because I think that's what everybody needs to hear is how, how this is actually gone. Uh, John, anything else before we get it over to Shervin? Uh, no, no. I, I think Shervin uh, would be perfect to speak about the, the implementations and benefits, especially from a practical perspective with, with all the experience that, that he has had recently with it. Uh, Shervin. Thank you. So uh, initially when we endeavored on this, we, we had some of our hesitations with respect to if, if, if it's uh, legal, if we can hold, if it can uphold in court, What's the adaptation going to be like? So we had our rationale for going forward with it, and one of it was just limiting touches. So meaning the less human touches that are going to be involved, the less that we're going to reduce the number of errors that come out of the documentation process because the back and forth that comes along with, hey, you missed the signature here, hey, you didn't initial there, or date this, that was certainly something that we wanted to try to, we were constantly trying to eliminate in our process and our system. Um, so, so the limit, limiting touches, reducing the errors, cutting down the funding time overall, you know, as Bob mentioned, the goal of having a funding to take place in a couple of hours can, is, is even a fantastic uh, goal to attain, but we actually would like to have it such that Someone who goes into in the in the uh, in the application of, for example, a dealership that's selling trucks. They go in, pick out the truck, get approved, get documents, and funded, and can walk out with their truck the same day. Uh, same with uh, uh, any other equipment that they might be purchasing. Um, so, and then on the the operation side, minimizing or eliminating the amount of paper that we have to deal with and shuffle and and uh, file, store, have to manage, uh, make sure we increase our safety and security. Again, as uh, John pointed out, it's more a matter of control rather than actually managing those records. Um, and then just simplifying the, the overall process for the signer as well. So those were some of the expectations that we went in, we endeavored into this with. Um, and found that we are finding some of those coming to fruition. But it was a process. It was a little bit of a bigger process than we had initially uh, thought it would be because initially we figured, well, it's largely adopted. You know, some of the, the larger companies and corporations are doing this on a daily basis. As Bob pointed out, Tesla's, you, know, you don't even have a paper that you sign and you walk out with your car. So we figured it'd be the same type of adapt adaptation cu curve. Well, um, it wasn't that fast. <laughs> so the, in terms of the legal, uh, we definitely wanted to check with our own counsel first. So as, you, as I mentioned, Bob's one of our counsel, and he definitely ensured us about the enforceability. Well, there's also your creditors that come to get involved. Um, we knew that our, a couple of our larger creditors uh, have adopted and accepted this form as legal um, and something that they can actually implement and roll out. Um, however, even with that, there's a lot of back and forth with respect to making sure that the legal documentation that we are obligating ourselves to is not overreaching. So at one point, and because it's something that's so new, the uh, creditors may ask for things 
and this happened with us where they where they're asking us to um, indemnify others of for part of the technology for example so these are some of the specifics that legal counsel can really help to filter through sift through and make sure that it's something that doesn't uh, tie bind you to something that's uh, larger than what you should have uh, you should basically have your uh, as your scope of, of um, coverage. Um, so in terms of security from the creditor standpoint, you know, eOriginal, DocuSign, they worked together. eOriginal was fantastic. They actually had done this with several creditors that, um, in the past, had everything lined up for us um, in terms of security, so all the white papers. But then there's review and acceptance, so there's some time. There's just time that has to be reviewed and questions come back, and again, uh, the response that, that has to just be accounted for in terms of the implementation, and then you have technology. So for us, it was um, we had to make an investment of time and money um, to implement this into our process and workflow. You have to uh, we, we use Salesforce as our credit adjudication and CRM. So eOriginal and DocuSign happen to have uh, applications that. It, with API plugins that actually work directly with those. So um, incorporation was not as difficult a task or painstaking for us, but it still was and evolves and is an ongoing process which involves some customization and whatnot. Um, but there are other applications that would need a whole implementation from scratch. So there's definitely that um, that needs to be addressed and planned out from the from the get go, um, I'm touching all all of these on a high level uh, in the interest of time. So, um, it, your staff your staff needs to buy in, understand the process. They have to have the knowledge to answer questions. They have to be comfortable enough with it so that they know whether or not it's going to be something that uh, um, can be they they can uh, get a go ahead on or if they need to wait or if they need to change a process uh, change something or get clearance on. Uh, all of these factors come into play, and it's kind of like learn. It's a little bit of learning by doing, um, and I'll I'll touch on a couple of those examples um, when it comes to the clients buying in, because that's the other part of it. Is we deal with brokers and we deal with vendors, so the brokers tend to have a little bit of the uh, pushback in terms of wanting to control the process. You know, they're used to getting documents looking at them, reviewing them, sending them out, being able to answer questions on them. Well, when you're dealing with this DocuSign process, it's a little bit different. So just being able to understand and acknowledge that there are maybe some changes that need to be addressed. Um, okay, we've got time. Uh, so overall, those, those are some of the high points that need to be addressed, need to be looked at. Um, before you embark, engage into this process. But we have seen quicker funding times. Um, we have, Allison, if you want to go to that next slide, by the way. Uh, so we've seen that our client expectations have been exceeded in uh, several respects. They, it gives us a leg up on others. It gives us the ability to uh, get the signatures in and documents done without having the driver or the lessee or the signator to have to come in so they could actually sign it by phone on their phone app. Um, and just cost reduction, that is something that we've definitely seen in just the number of hours of manpower involved with each transaction the time that it takes post funding to put these files into uh, you know records management um, filing them storing them maintaining them um, the technological improvements speak to themselves just the ability to manage the entire process knowing where things are I mean when you send out a DocuSign document you can actually know when something was opened, how long it was looked at, if it was signed, and when it was completed. Um, and of course, just the overall business efficiency is, it allows us 
to do significantly more volume with the same uh, with, with the same staff um, by way of just having all these technological uh, improvements. And I know we're short on time, so okay. I some questions. Um, what I can do is um, let me go through the legal benefits of e-signature in a couple of minutes, and then we'll have some questions coming through. Um, so next slide. Uh, okay. So uh, I looked at the attendee list, and, and what I can gather is that most of you are all in the leasing or asset-based loan industry, equipment financing, notes, et cetera. Our litigation strategy is very straightforward. Uh, we commence suit. We review the defendant's answers. We hope to do no discovery because that's expensive. For those of you who are not legally minded, that's exchanging documents, taking depositions, things of that nature. And then we move for summary judgment that basically says, hey, there's no reason for this case to go to trial. We should win no matter what they say. The classic um, defense that people throw out there is the equipment didn't work. We had a problem with this. We had a problem with that. The hell and high water clauses, the disclaimers that are in all your lease documents, okay, is pretty good, and, and you usually win when it comes, okay, to those types of defenses. Next slide, please. There are one or two exceptions to that, and they normally come up in a guarantee setting, okay, and that's a forgery. I never signed the document. Now, what do you normally have? You have a, a piece of paper with someone's signature on it. At best, maybe you have a, a notary. Maybe you have a witness, Okay, or the unauthorized alteration. That's not the document I signed. All right, and now there's, there's a battle of the forms as to which document is there. The problem with those two defenses is that there is what's called an issue of fact, a credibility issue. Is this the, is this the person's signature or not? You can't prove that without experts. Next slide. So once you get to that point, okay, um, with a traditional wet signature, somebody says, I didn't sign the document, I didn't sign the lease. Now you need handwriting experts. Was it their signature? Wasn't their signature? Were they authorized? Okay, this was not the document I signed. We'll see what they produced, what they didn't produce. Okay, essentially what that creates is discovery, handwriting experts, expert testimony. We cannot get rid of the case quickly. We cannot put pressure on the lessee to uh, come up with an, an acceptable settlement. It increases your legal expenses, and it puts pressure on all the funding sources and lessors to settle case on less favorable terms because they don't want to go through the expense or time to wait to get paid. Next slide. So what you have with an e-signature, which is much better than an ink signature, is you have an entire trail of how this document got signed that was documented. Remember all the authentication tools we talked about earlier? Well, you don't have that with a regular ink guarantee or an ink lease. You've got people signing in. You've got people selecting passwords. You've got IP addresses. You've got SMS verification. It is very difficult for people to claim that they're not them because of all of that. Now, we know in the industry that most of these forgery defenses are not, are not legitimate. They're just something in there to delay the works, to create a problem for us. What we're finding is that with going with electronic signatures, not only are you not getting those defenses, those legitimate defenses, because you've really taken more steps to verify the people on the other end of the document, but you're getting less, okay, fabricated defenses, all of which is excellent so that you can get to summary judgment or settle the case quicker. Next slide, please. There's one case. Um, so what does this do? It increases the chance that you can prevail on a motion for summary judgment. So your legal costs will be reduced and a favorable settlement can be reached. Next slide. This is one case which I will not get into very uh, in any detail, but essentially somebody changed their insurance uh, policy uh, six months before they died electronically, and the former beneficiaries, okay, challenged it. Next slide. They moved for summary judgment, and the court granted it based upon the strength of the e-signature process. And they cited various things which are on your, your screen there, and it's an excellent uh, precedent for why electronic signatures should work and how they can actually get you to summary judgment quicker than a traditional ink signature. Now, I went through all of that very, very quickly. 
um, look over the case, discuss it with any of the panelists, your counsel, whoever it is, but that is additional support uh, to um, the statutes that I, I mentioned earlier, eSign and UEDA, on how A, it's enforceable, and particularly in this case, how you can get the summary judgment quicker than you would under a normal ink signature. Now, I know we're running light on time, so if people have any questions, I think the panel's ready to go forward. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, panelists, for a great event. Um, we've now recorded, reached the uh, Q&A portion of our webinar. Um, before you guys ask questions, I do just want to note that um, it's been brought to our attention that our webinar provider had um, some hic hiccups in the beginning. So we've recorded our entire session, and we will be sending out um, the recording to everyone who registered to attend today's session. Um, so those people that did have problems hopping on in the beginning um, can get the entire presentation. With that said, if you do have a question, please use your chat window and message it to me, and I'll facilitate that to our panelists. Uh, we do have a couple questions that have come in, um, and our first one I'll throw out, um, looks like John Jacobs could do a good job of answering this, or Bob, but how are my peers authenticating? What are the industry best practices, and how will my funders accept? Hi, uh, this, yeah, this is John. I can start with it. Uh, from from an authentication perspective, uh, the, across the industry, I use uh, I see the ID verification tool um, being utilized uh, quite frequently. Um, now, if you go back a couple of years, it was really the only multi-factor or additional tool that was available to you to, to utilize um, that was also sufficient and strong and solid. Um, as uh, Shervin and Bob have mentioned, you know, over the past couple of years, we've seen further available tools uh, like SMS. Um, I think what is most important is having a multi-factor process. That way you're not dependent on one piece of information. You have multiple pieces of information to, to assist in proving identity. Um, so whether it be SMS or ID verification, I think both additions are, are quite sufficient uh, for, for these types of, of processes uh, when authenticating. Um, from, from a banking perspective, the, the funders, uh, funding sources, yeah, they're, gonna, they're going to want to know what you're doing, um, you know, how you're authenticating, uh, you know, just taking that measure to ensure what you're doing is consistent with your peers, which is ID verification or insurance cases, SMS. Um, most importantly, the bankers will, will be more concerned about ensuring that they're receiving the original document um, and, and the, the relevant evidence that comes with that. Bob, would you add anything, or, or Shervin? No, I, I, I mean, Shervin, you would know more um, about uh, what your, your funders are asking for, but uh, I think most peers, that at least most of the leasing companies I, I know, are doing more than simply an out of the wallet verification. Um, they they want to do that and something else, and that's what we're recommending. Yeah, it, it's just I mean, the out of wallet question is by the by and far the um, way that we choose to to implement. Um, however, in the case of as I said, if they're sitting in front of whoever they're signing with. We'll go to the SMS, but we don't. We don't go any uh, less than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we have a couple of questions from the uh, additional questions regarding authentication. Um, we have one that says, "Do you see any reluctance of signatories to provide their cell numbers to enable SMS messaging of a PIN?" Uh, do you have any of that, Shervin? No, because we collect that as part of the deal anyway. We work very heavily with SMS text technology, so uh, even in our collections efforts, our billing, so that's uh, that's pretty much a standard of, of having that in, in place. And, and one of the other questions was, if you cannot use an SMS or a cell number, uh, what is the next best method other than a knowledge-based question to verify the signer? John, any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, it depends. It's situational, uh, whether it's uh, the re remotely or um, or face to face. Uh, there, there are verification additions uh, that you can add to the process. Uh, for instance, using multimedia verification. This is not authentication. It's just additional multimedia evidence to, to support in the package. For instance, 
if the mobile device that they're signing the, the document from, let's say an iPad, is enabled with a, a camera, um, you could set up the, the process in such a way to request a, a picture, um, or say it's enabled with a microphone. Um, you could set it up to request a voice sample um, that would be saved with, with that transaction. Um, so there are additional verification um, services uh, and, and methods that could be added to it that are pretty cool. Okay. Uh, and I think there's one other question directed to you that I can see here. John, how does eOriginal assure that a lease finance temporarily in a warehouse loan facility can only be papered out for delivery to non-recourse lender upon signature of the warehouse lender, i.e., how, how do you assure a warehouse lender of that level of control? So there are, there are several things that, that can be put in place. Um, if first off, you, you have uh, in the finance industry uh, traditional custodians that, um, that might be leveraged to, to really manage the processes uh, as, as dictated by the, the lender um, uh, on, on behalf of, of the, the, the finance relationship. Um, in, in that case, uh, a lot of uh, or many of the financial custodians today um, are, are leveraging eOriginal uh, solution or beginning to leverage um, the vaulting solution to act as, as what they, they call e-custodians, um, where they can ensure that level of, of uh, security and process in, in compliance with your relationship with the, the warehouses, ensuring that um, the documents can't go anywhere unless uh, approved. Um, by the, the warehouse lender um, and, of course, uh, the, the borrower, right? So ensuring that those procedures are, are properly in place. And there are also instances today where eOriginal acts as a uh, third-party collateral agent um, to ensure uh, the, the protection um, of those assets um, and to ensure the, um, the, the protection and, and the ability to perfect uh, by the lender, uh, where there are certain, what I'll say, rules uh, that can be set up to ensure that um, one can only receive control of that unique authoritative copy, um, it, whether it's uh, for for the needs of perfection or, or sale, um, or you know, or one might not be able to receive control of that authoritative copy if there's another party that has a security interest in it. So there are certain um, procedures that we can take in place as a third party to assist in kind of dictating those those policies. Okay, I think we're uh, running short on time. Um, Everyone who's on the in webinar, uh, you have our email addresses. If another question pops up, feel free to email me or one of the other panelists. I'm sure we'll be happy to uh, answer uh, whatever we can. And uh, thank you for your attendance, and uh, we look forward to speaking to you guys again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. The session's ending.